Well, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to 1 Samuel 16 this morning. 1 Samuel 16. Every now and then, I come across some church bulletin bloopers, and uh, I like to share those with you. So here's a few of them. The outreach committee has enlisted 25 visitors to make calls on people who are not afflicted by any church. (laughs) (laughs) The pastor would appreciate if the ladies of the congregation would lend them their electric girdles for the pancake breakfast next Sunday. (laughs) I don't know what that is, but I don't want to find out. (laughs) The third verse of Blessed Assurance will be sung without any musical accomplishment. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a good chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Also, bring your husbands. The peacemaking committee has rescheduled uh, their meeting due to a conflict. (laughs) The evening service tonight, the sermon topic is, what is hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. (laughs) Oh, we gotta love typos. Well, last week we left off with um, the reign of Saul that Saul was anointed the first king over Israel, and he started off pretty well. When the first big test came, he met it well, but then pride began to grow in Saul, and he began to disobey, and it led to continual disobedience, to the point where Samuel, God through Samuel said, he has rejected you as king, and that someone else would take his place. And so we saw some of the major themes that these texts Uh, pop up last week, where the prideful and the wicked are brought low, and Saul certainly fit that category. And so at this point in these texts, Saul is not being a very good king, and word has gotten out that God is going to anoint a new king over Israel and reject Saul. The question is, who will that be? And that's where we pick up this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I'm going to begin by reading verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? As Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did as the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him and asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called uh, Abinabab, and he said, Pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had Shema pass, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? They are still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and brought him in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in his presence. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel went to Ramah. So the word comes to Samuel. It's time to anoint the next king of Israel. And then all that transpires after that is probably something that no one really expected to happen. 
So as we move through this chapter this morning, I just want to point out a few important things. First thing I want to point out is just Samuel's heart for God. Samuel's heart for God. One thing to note right off the bat is that Samuel had this heart for the Lord. And it's something he exhibited his whole life. If you remember, before Saul was made king, Samuel was Israel's leader. And Samuel had led them well. He had led them to victory. And here again you see Samuel has a heart for the Lord. And a few ways he shows that is, one, he mourns sin. He mourns sin. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? What you see is Samuel, he's mourning over Saul's fall. And how he sinned and what it means for the nation. He's in mourning over the, the sins of Saul. And it shows a man who has a heart for God. And that's one thing as Christians I hope we don't lose is that we mourn when we see sin in the world. Amen. That when we look at the sins of our nation and the direction that we're headed, that we would have a mournful thought about that. That we wouldn't pass by sin and get used to sin, but that we would still mourn for sin in the world. And that's where Samuel is at. He's mourning over what has transpired. But God says, okay, Samuel, it's time to stop mourning and time to get walking. Or I'm going to have you anoint the next king. And the second thing is he trusted God. He trusted God. Samuel says, how can I go? If Saul hears this, he will kill me. And that's a valid point, I think, right? Um, from what we have seen from Saul to this point, certainly doesn't seem beneath him to kill Samuel. And if you think about, um, I mean, imagine if you're working at your job and all of a sudden you hear that your company is searching for your replacement and you have no idea. <laughs> You're probably not very happy about that, right? Um, like you read in the paper that advertising your position. You're going to be like, um, what's going on here, right? Um, so in the case of a king, though, if Saul hears that Samuel is out looking for someone to anoint as the next king, Saul might take him out. But Samuel goes anyway. And that leads to the third one is that Samuel was obedient. In verse 4 it says Samuel did what the Lord said. Simple verse but a profound verse. Samuel did what the Lord said. Um, and, and, and this is such a contrast to Saul. Remember last week, one of the points we made was that continued obedience is important. Continued obedience is important in our walk with God. We must continue to follow Jesus. And one of Saul's downfalls was, at one point in time, he just seemed to stop obeying the Lord. He seemed to stop caring. Um, he took matters into his own hands of what he thought he should do. But here, Samuel is demonstrating obedience and trust in God. That Even though there is a danger to him for going on this little quest to anoint the next king of Israel, he's going anyway. He's trusting the Lord with the results. And so Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and he invites Jesse and his sons to the sacrifice where the next king will be chosen. And then God does something that no one expects. And that's the second point I want to make this morning, is that is God works in inverse ways. God works in inverse ways. So often God does not do what we expect or what we think he should do. I don't know how many times God has done things that I'm like, well, that's not how I would do it. And God's like, and that's why you're not God, right? <laughs> he works in inverse ways. Amen. Opposite of what human wisdom would tell us. And choosing David is another example of that. I mean, imagine this, that David was so kind of like cast aside, he wasn't even invited to the shindig, right? Like, he's out tending sheep while all the other sons are there. It's like... Well, if one of the sons are, going, sons are going to be chosen as king, we know it ain't him. So we're not even going to bother bringing him in. We're going to send him out to the sheep, and surely one of these other brothers will be chosen. <clears throat> and I love how this begins. When Samuel arrived, he sees Eliab, and it says that he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here, right? So he sees the oldest of Jesse's sons, and apparently he looked apart. Does that sound familiar? just like Saul. Saul looked the part of king. It said he stood a head higher than the rest of anyone else. Um, and so Samuel sees Eliab and he thinks, wow, 
he looks like a king. Surely that's God's anointed. And God's almost like, hold on. Saul looked apart, didn't he? And look how that turned out. And God makes a very profound statement. He says, I'm not looking at the outward appearance. I'm looking at the heart. He says, I'm looking for something else. Because looks can be deceiving. Just because a per person looks one way doesn't mean they're going to be that way. Right. You can look like a king and turn out to be a pretty crummy one. And you can look like a teenage shepherd boy and turn out to be a pretty good king. Amen. God knows the heart. And if we're just judging by appearances, we can be so easily deceived. That's right. I heard about a priest who was sailing... Um, across the Atlantic Ocean on an ocean liner. And when he got aboard, he found out that he'd be sharing a room with another passenger. And so he goes to his cabin and he meets his roommate. And something about this roommate just didn't quite sit right with him. So he goes to the customer service and he asks if he could leave his gold watch and other valuables in the ship's safe. And he explained that I don't ordinarily do this, but after meeting the man I'm going to be sharing a cabin with for the whole trip, I just don't trust him with the valuables in the room. And the customer service rep accepted the things and said, it's all right, I'll be glad to take care of them for you. The man you're sharing a room with was up here 10 minutes ago with the exact same story anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Looks can be deceiving. And so God is after something deeper than someone who just looked the part for the king. He's after someone who has the heart to be God's king. And so Samuel goes through all of David's brothers and says, to each, and God says to each one of them, no, this is not the one. And finally they all go by and Samuel's like, so is there anyone else? In fact, there was. The youngest, the one they hadn't even invited, out doing the unglamorous work of tending sheep. And they send for David and when he arrives, it says he was glowing with health, had fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint this one. Amen. And what a shock that must have been to everyone present. The young teenage shepherd boy, the youngest walks in. I mean, they had to be thinking like, he's too young. He doesn't look like a king. What do you mean he's the one? And all this points back to God works in inverse ways. So often God works from the bottom up and not the top down. God doesn't seek out the powerful. He seeks out the unpowerful and the humble in order to raise them up for his purposes. Amen. And this goes back to one of the major themes we saw in this book in week one, that God raises the humble and he equips his people. And so God takes someone who is in a very humble position, the youngest of a large family, out tending sheep, but God saw something in David that God would call a man after his own heart. Amen. And it went against human wisdom to anoint him as king, but God saw the heart and saw that David had something that Saul didn't have. Amen. He had something his brothers didn't have, a heart after the ways of the Lord. And even though he was young and not even initially invited to the thing, God said, I'm going to raise him up as king because I see his heart. And the next thing I want us to see as a major theme in this book is God's equipping. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. One of the themes of this book is how God brings up the humble and equips his people. And we see God equipping David after he's anointed. It says the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. And as we said last week, anytime you see that in the Old Testament, that is significant. Because it's always God equipping his people to do a task, and usually a difficult task. Whenever you see the spirit of the Lord came on them in the Old Testament, it's significant. Now remember, he's young, he's inexperienced, and he's certainly not ready to just take the throne in his current position. But what is amazing is what God begins to do from that moment on in order to equip David to be the king he's supposed to be. And that continues to the rest of the chapter. If we read verses 14 through 23 of the rest of the chapter, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit of the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See an evil spirit. 
uh, from God is tormenting you, um, let our servants here search out for someone who can play the liar. And he will play when the evil spirit of God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the liar. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, bring me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took donkeys, a loaded bread, a, bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat and sent them, to, uh, sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. When Saul, then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am well pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit of God came on Saul, David would take the lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul, and he would feel better, and the evil spirit would lead him. So what we see here is Saul's in a bad place, all right? Saul's in a really bad place. Um, his obstinate heart and hardness towards God has resulted in God withdrawing his spirit from him, and now he's being tormented by a spirit. Now, there's a whole lot of we could get in on that little passage right there, right? That we're not going to get in today, but we'll just say this. He's in a bad place, and it's not getting any better, and they have this idea that what if we brought in someone who plays well, and maybe it will soothe Saul's soul. And so they bring in David, who is this talented harp player, to help with Saul. Now I have to laugh at this a little bit, because the harp isn't really considered a manly instrument to play by our standards, right? Like, you don't see a whole lot of men today um, playing the harp, let alone manly men playing the harp, right? And David is a manly man. I mean, I'll pick on him because he's not here, but imagine Bart playing the harp, right? Um... <laughs> That'd be quite a sight, right? See this man, and, and, and writing poetry. We know that David was a poet, right? He wrote a, a ton of psalms that we have. So David is this harp-playing poet who also kills lions and bears with his hands, right? <laughs> kind of this weird conundrum. I mean, I can only imagine the poetry Bart would write. <laughs> oh, elk, I shall slay thee, right? Uh, but the thing is this, you would never dare call David a girly man. Why? Because he would take you out, right? David is no girly man. He is, I call him a renaissance man, right? He's just good at everything, right? He does poetry, he plays the harp, and oh yeah, he will beat you in a fight, right? Um, but back to the point, they find that music helps give Saul peace. So David, a talented harp player, comes and plays for him. It works. And David keeps doing this, and eventually Saul goes, I want to keep David here full time. In fact, he makes him an armor bearer. And so David becomes, goes and lives with Saul. Now picture this. David has been anointed as the next king of Israel. But he's young, and he's inexperienced. So what does God do? He puts David in a position to learn how to be king. He puts him right beside the current king, right next to the throne. I mean, could you ask for better training for a young teenage boy who's anointed the next king than to put him right next to the current king so he can watch how stuff is going? God put David in a position to learn how to do the job, and not only that, but he could observe Saul's bad decisions and his good decisions and learn from them. And that's because God equips his people for the work he calls them to do. Amen. I have been amazed at how God can equip his people for the plans he has in store for us, sometimes without us even knowing it. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. That all of a sudden something pops out in your life that you have to do and you see that long ago God began preparing you for this time and this moment? He continually places us in places and positions to help us learn, to get ready for what he has in store for us to do. God will never put you in a position that he is not in the process of preparing you to do or will not give you what you need to do it. Amen. He is always at work. And I just have to conclude all of this. God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Like He really knows what he's doing. And sometimes we just need to trust in that. 
that he will equip us and get us to the places where we need to go in order to carry out his plans that he has for us. Amen. It's amazing how God equips his people for his work. I heard about a small village in Sweden. There was a young girl who was very, very poor. She was unskilled, and she could only get along by doing menial jobs, but she loved to sing. And despite her poverty, she dreamed one day of being a great singer. And so she began to sing on street corners, hoping that people who passed by would throw her a coin or two. Well, each day she sang, um, nothing really became of it, until one day a great musician happened to pass by and heard her sing. And he was entranced by her voice. And so he took her and he began to teach her how to use her voice in an even better way. And in time, he was able to get her into some bigger performances. And today we know her by her name, the Swedish Nightingale, Jenny Lind. And all it took was to be in the right place at the right time and hear the right person hear you in order to be put in a position that would change your life. Amen. Well, that's exactly what happened to David. He's been anointed as the next king, and by happenstance, happenstance, more like God providence, he finds himself serving the king and living in the palace, Amen. watching and learning. And as we'll see next week, very early on, David begins to establish himself as a true leader. And in fact, very early on, a much better leader than Saul ever was. So I have a few things that I want to hammer home this morning before we go. Um, some take-homes. First one is this, and I think we so need this today. God is at work when things look bad. God is at work when things look bad. If you're Samuel, think about how bleak things looked. First, the people of Israel demand a king, which wasn't a good thing. Then the king comes, and now he's disobeyed God on multiple occasions, and it's definitely not a good thing. And in the midst of things looking really bad, God was still active and still moving. And he led him to anoint David as king. And so something we must remember is, no matter how bleak things look in the world around us, no matter how much wickedness we're surrounded with, we need to take heart because God is still working. Amen. He's still moving. He's still calling. John 5, 17 says, My father is always at work to this very day, and I am working too. And I might amend this a little bit and say, maybe sometimes, especially in the darkness, God is moving. Amen. God is always moving, even in the darkness. And it can be so discouraging to look at the world around us and look at the condition of things. But take heart, because God is still at work. He's still moving. And don't forget that. Amen. Secondly, don't judge by appearances. I mean, this is something we hammer home to, like, grade school kids from, like, day one, right? Um, don't judge a book by its cover. And a while back, we did a series about shifting from seen to unseen, where we as the people of God must learn to look at the world and people and circumstances through the lens of faith. That we must begin to learn to think and see the world as God does. And David may not have looked like the next king, but he was God's choice. <laughs> Even though his older brother looked apart, God chose David. And so we must learn to look beyond what our eyes can see and look to the heart of the matter. And with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, he will give us insights far beyond what our eyes can see. Amen. John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And I have to say, that right judgment can only come by listening to the Spirit of God. There are a lot of circumstances that may look good, may seem good, but thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit and his warning signs in us that can give us insight into things beyond what we can see. And so don't judge by appearances, but allow the Spirit to help you see the reality of a situation. Amen. And then thirdly, have faith in God's equipping. Have faith in God's equipping. God equips his people, and if God calls you to do something, he will help you do it. Amen. 
He will equip and empower, empower you, just as he did David. And, you know, like so many others throughout Scripture, I just have to say, there are most days I wake up in the morning, I feel very ill-equipped to do what I do most days. <laughs> um, but that's why every morning I ask for God's help. And that's what we must do. We need to stay dependent upon God. Have faith that he will see us through. And guess what? He will. He will. Even if he calls you to do something crazy. And sometimes he does. God has a way of bringing us out of our comfort zones. Out of the things that we think we're qualified to do. Out of the things that we even want to do. (laughs) And yet, when we obey him and when we trust him, we find that he has equipped us for the task. And even those moments where you are ill-equipped to do it, that's when the power of his spirit takes over. There have been some times where I will say, I was not even close to equipped to do what, needed to, what I needed to do. And that's when I pray my favorite prayer in the world, God help. It takes a second, but oh, is it profound, God help. And I have to say, sometimes what has come out of my mouth, I go back and I go, that was really good. That didn't come from me, because I know what I would have said in my natural self, and huh, <laughs> right? But when we depend on God, he has a way of coming through. Amen. He will come through. And so maybe he's calling you to do something right now. Maybe it's difficult. Maybe it's uncomfortable. Maybe it's something you don't want to do. I've told many of you the last thing in the world I wanted to do was be a pastor. Some of you are like, it's the last thing we wanted you to do as well. (laughs) But when we obey, it unleashes his spirit. It unleashes his presence in our life. And we find that those things that we never thought we'd do or wanted to do, not only can we do it in his spirit, but he gives us joy and peace as we do it as well. And so if he's calling you to do something today, uncomfortable or whatever, maybe he's calling you to ministry. I believe he is calling some people here to ministry. Why? Because we need pastors. We need people to step up and do that work. And if he is calling you, obey. Because there is no better place to be than in the center of his will. Even if it seems difficult or insurmountable, in him all things are possible. And you can imagine David, right? I'm anointed to do what? Are you sure? (laughs) And yet, we know the story. That David would become king. And indeed, God would equip him for the task. So my prayer for all of us this morning, and my final word to you today, is as a closing prayer, I just want to quote Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go equipped by his power, you are dismissed.